This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Well, hello and welcome to Self Work. I can't believe I've given that intro now 100 times. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford, and we're celebrating 100 episodes together. The first thing I want to say is I wouldn't be going this strong without your support and interest. So many of you have left ratings and reviews on iTunes or Podbean or Stitcher. Thank you so much for that. One of the last ones that was given was only six words long but meant so much to me. It said very simply, you don't know how you're helping. I'm very humbled and very honored that you're here for episode 100. I've been spending the last few months asking you to send in your questions, and sure enough, you have, because today's episode is all about you. I've chosen six very different questions, and I'm going to answer them. Before I get to that, I want to thank the people who are very directly responsible for helping me with this podcast. First and foremost is my audio engineer, John Crowley of Loudmouth Studios in Little Rock, Arkansas. His spirit and his talent and our own sort of funny banter has helped keep my own interest alive, and he has saved me hundreds of hours of editing. So thank you so much, John. I want to thank Christine Mathias, who is my assistant out in California, who does all kinds of things, and Jeanette Baeza Collins, who is here locally and gives me lots of support and ideas for how to grow this podcast and other things that I'm doing or trying to do. Of course, I want to thank my husband, Richard Rutherford, my son, and the many friends I have. My husband stays very still upstairs while I do this every weekend, so he gives me a lot of silent support. (laughs) Today, there's also something special. I'm giving away five of my gift books on marriage. Now, these are not tomes. These are truly little gift books to use as a gift for the person you love, the person you're married to or partnered with. It's called Marriage is Not for Chickens. I'm going to autograph five of them and send them out to the first five of you who email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. Just email me after this episode is aired on Friday the 26th. I think you'll enjoy the book. It's a great stocking stuffer or holiday gift, but its message is basically our marriage has been worth all the trials, all the tribulations, and certainly all the joys. So now let's settle into some of these questions. Let me let you know what the topics are. The first is how to stop using the childhood strategies you've created. There was an episode on identifying those, but how do you actually change them? The second is the effect on your own anxiety when you have children. A common problem Number three is someone who strongly identifies with perfectly hidden depression. She talks about what led her to breaking down and her own efforts at getting help. The next is my answer to someone who's coping with infertility, how to handle that emotionally. The next one is we're going to talk a bit about alcoholism, AA, and Al-Anon. And lastly, we're hearing from a woman who struggles with overeating and shame. And she asks the question, why can't I stop? So very challenging questions, really diverse topics. I'm thrilled to be here on episode 100. So let's get down to these questions. Again, this episode is going to be a little longer than normal, perhaps a lot longer. I'm not real sure. But I wanted to get to some of your really, really great questions. First, let's hear from someone again who can identify her childhood strategies, but changing them feels really vulnerable. She says, hello, I've been reading and listening to your podcast about procrastination and how to be an emotional grown-up. It resonates a lot with what I'm going through and what I'm discussing with my therapist. But do you have any recommendations on how to deconstruct our strategies? Once I identify them, what do I do now? I feel like I'm walking blindfolded and feel so vulnerable as I try different things. Very simple question. 
I said, great question. You get to the heart with your question of how we actually affect change. Recognizing old strategies is the first step, but then you have to discover the beliefs that are justifying those strategies. Then you challenge the belief and risk another choice or behavior. As you risk another choice, you'll discover the emotions that that strategy was hiding. I'll take an example from my own life, which many of you have told me you enjoy hearing. I was highly overprotected, so one of my strategies was to become quite stubborn and do things my mom didn't want me to do, and I did it behind her back, like one time auditioning for a play that she thought would be too much or flirting with a guy when she thought I was too young. That strategy turned out in my 20s to wreak a lot of chaos because my belief was I'm not going to be controlled by anyone. And another belief was, I'll say yes to everything I can, almost kind of frantically. And certainly it didn't help that I was drawn into relationships where control was an underlying issue. Guess what? But that was normal, given what was going on in my head. When I got some therapy and finally recognized what I was doing, then I had to challenge that belief system and change it. My beliefs changed into, I can ask for help. I can say no. I don't have to be in control. I can admit vulnerability. Now, when I acted on these new beliefs, strong emotions surfaced, shame, anger, confusion, and it was only then that I began to sort out those emotions. So basically what you have to do is think about the rules you followed and the message that those rules gave you about your own life. Then you risk the new behavior, and there are your emotions that those rules were trying to govern. And as you work on each emotion, yes, you're going to feel vulnerable, but it's so worth it. Okay, second on the list is a very poignant question about having children and also experiencing a huge increase in anxiety. I was diagnosed at a young age with anxiety as well as depression. For 15 years of my life, I have fought the good fight, managing to keep my head above the water. I'm a young mom of two, and my anxiety has worsened with each child. I spend each minute of every day and night worrying. I feel when I'm not worrying, I'm not in control. I live in the constant fear of something happening to my children. It consumes me to no end. I'm frightened to take them anywhere, leave them with anyone, and God forbid, lose them. My logic tries to speak, but my obsessive anxiousness quiets it very quickly. I'm at a loss. I want to start enjoying my life with my children and stop being so fearful of every situation. So here's my answer. Hello. You know, increased worry can often occur when you just become a parent, but it sounds as if your level of anxiety is through the roof. I'd highly recommend finding a psychologist or a therapist in your area that's very well versed in anxiety treatment. You can find that out on their website and then seek that treatment. Because your anxiety could stem from so many different things, and having someone help you discover the source can be really life-changing. You may need medication, at least at first. For example, I had a patient in the recent past who had tremendous anxiety about her children, but what she realized with treatment was that she had been highly controlled in her marriage, and she was actually sort of passing the buck. And if she was going to be that angry on the inside and fear what her husband was about to say next or what rule would govern her life next, then she became very anxious and agitated herself. Yes, she was a fairly anxious person in the first place, but her anger and her unhappiness in her marriage is what was fueling the obsessiveness. A therapist can help you see that. Maybe you can see it in yourself. But again, your children as they age will absorb more and more of your anxiety. And I can tell that you love them and that is a burden you don't want to give them. Because that kind of fear can be very paralyzing. So please seek help. You know, I don't always say that to people who write me because I believe that a lot of things can be done on your own journey with yourself. But... I do know that therapy offers a relationship that can help you by leaps and bounds when you find a relationship that is very comforting and reassuring and yet also sometimes confronting. There's a lot 
of healing that can go on in that relationship that you really can't get anywhere else. So next is a story about someone with perfectly hidden depression. As many of you know, I'm writing a book on the topic, which will be out November of 2019. I'm so excited and thrilled and terrified. (laughs) So here she goes. I've been listening to your podcast for quite a while. I thankfully came across them at a time when I needed them most, as recommended by a friend. I'm practically textbook PhD. I'm an overachiever, the first in my family to attend university, excellent and impressive grades. You name it, I conquer it. I grew up in a dysfunctional family, a working mom who drank and took drugs, a father who was mostly out of the picture with my mom continuously villainizing him. So I threw myself into work. I didn't allow any time for myself, ever. It was lazy to do so. My needs didn't come first. Relationship after relationship broke down, and I resented each of them. But I was always praised for my effort, my drive, my positive attitude. I was a girl who had the weight of the world on her shoulders, but I was also the one who fixes things. I couldn't be alone. My brain didn't shut off. I overanalyzed, over-scrutinized, and paid attention to every detail. I lived in a state of perpetual anxiety. Then... I fell unexpectedly pregnant. It wasn't the plan. I had a career. I was the only female executive at my firm. I couldn't fail. So I got an abortion. This event was the catalyst for my unraveling. After that, I discovered I had a potentially life-threatening medical problem. It was so much to process that I'd never really acknowledged anything I felt. I felt guilty for feeling. So I rationally and logically found a therapist and assumed I'd see them and would all go back to normal. But the second session, my therapist suggested that my mother, my mom as she calls it, had undiagnosed borderline personality disorder. My world crashed. I read book after book about it. And I'm sure she does. I became worse and experienced panic attacks multiple times a day. I shook physically, dissociated, bawled at nothing, dreaded living, and I became suicidal. I couldn't cope with the obligation anymore. I wanted out. My work eventually sent me to the doctors. The following five months were horrific, but I started digging. I realized I had needs too, and it wasn't my job to look after everyone else. I remembered parts of being sexually abused, helped by my sister. She filled in the blanks. I'm recovering. I'm building a relationship with my father. I'm setting boundaries with my mom for the first time in my life. No more suicidal calls, no more bandages on her arm to get my attention. I'm working less. I can actually say no now, although it's still hard. I can be alone for the first time in my life. I don't have to keep busy. It's incredible, but it's hard, and I'm recovering, slowly but surely, and it's so painful. Your podcasts nail it. First time I heard you talk about perfectly hidden depression, I had nine out of ten points you made. Your questionnaire, I only answered two no's. So that's her story. By the way, I will have the questionnaire in the show notes just for those of you who may be listening about perfectly hidden depression for the first time and see yourself in that. If you want The episodes I first recorded were three and four, but there are others interspersed throughout self-work. So let me get to my answer. Hi, your words speak so eloquently of what you've been through and where you're going. It takes tremendous courage to make a turnaround like that, managing emotions that come hurtling out when finally released. That's one of the major points I wanted to make because this work is very difficult. And when you've been hiding things under a mask of perfectionism, you can have incredibly difficult, overwhelming, almost ferocious feelings that emerge. So now back to my response. Bravo to you. I'm sure it's been very difficult, but I can also hear cathartic. It's interesting you mentioned the difficulty of sticking with the changes. My sense is that you almost have to corral a different kind of energy to do so. Basically, the energy it takes to initiate change isn't the same energy as it takes to maintain change. One of my perfectly hidden depressed patients said the other day, I hated hurting my husband, but if I'm going to be real, if he's going to really know me, I had to be honest. 
I felt bruised almost, like I'd crawl through a tunnel where I had to twist and turn and force myself to say and do things differently. So of course it's hard to say what you need. Every alarm is going off in your head that that is somehow wrong. But you're finding out it's not wrong. It's different. And your relationships will change as a consequence. So good for you. Good for your relationships. Again, please remember that depression doesn't have to look like melancholy or like you're not energetic about your life. It can look very, very different. It can look like perfectionism. Now we'll get to our fourth email, and it's one on infertility. Thank you so much for all your work. I have a suggestion for your 100th episode and or for any other episode. I know you had done one on infertility, but you mentioned in the most recent episode that this is something you have personally experienced, and I would really appreciate any more wisdom you can share on this topic. I've not found very many podcasts that are helpful, and while I'm working with doctors on next steps and the biological side of things, I've found bearing the emotional toll increasingly difficult as the months tick by. I hear that I'm not alone in this, but it's hard to really feel that way and hard to deal with the terrible shame, sense of failure, and anxiety and sadness that come with it. It's especially hard because I know these feelings are brought on by a specific situation. I have no idea when or how that situation may change. I'm in therapy and trying lots of things in my everyday life just to get through this difficult phase. So, here's my answer. Well, your email brings back so many memories. The painful feelings that are involved with every month having to make a new choice, decide what direction to go in, whether or not you're going to ramp up your efforts, try a new drug or treatment, try for adoption. And as you say, all of that with the background of grief, confusion, anger, and hopelessness that could all, quote unquote, go away with one positive pregnancy test, or that's how it feels at least. Also, you're often taking medications that can cause huge mood swings. I've told the story of being on a medication, I think it was Perganol, and I went in my office, I was in Dallas, and it was so early on that we still had plastic ashtrays in the office, and I picked up one after finding out that I had somebody cancel, and I threw it against the wall. My secretary looked at me, and I looked at her, and I said, you know, I think I'm going to go home, but you please cancel everybody else. I was mortified. But it was obvious I was in no place to do therapy. So back to my response. You can hear someone got pregnant a week after they married, or you see some mom being mean to her kids in a grocery store, and all of that can come crashing down around you. Or I guess you can hear that somebody canceled. Whatever. Also, it can put a tremendous strain on your relationship, trying to figure out the why of the trouble. Maybe it's you, maybe it's him, maybe it's a combination Maintaining a normal sexual intimacy, the longer the process goes on, the harder that is. And if you have an actual miscarriage, there's more grief, which people don't do a good job of supporting. Or they say things trying to be helpful, but they're not at all. Dealing with the financial cost or the practicalities of what's actually possible pragmatically. And, and, and. There's so many aspects to infertility and just feeling so out of control. My husband and I stayed sane by taking the occasional break from treatment, although you mentioned time ticking is an issue, trying to keep laughter part of our daily regimen, and talking about what we feared, that we wouldn't be able to have a child. What would we do if that happened? Looking back on it, I don't think we talked about the last one as much as I thought about it a lot. I went so far as to make goals for myself if I were to live without a child. That may seem contradictory to you, but it helped me to deal with what I couldn't control and focus perhaps on what I could. Good luck to you, of course. We were blessed with a child through IVF. And you're right, except for the worry that I might lose the pregnancy as I had miscarried before, many of those feelings dissipated. I will hope that that happens for you. Okay, this one is about AA and Al-Anon. Now, I want to say before I read this email and talk about it is that I am not an expert in any kind of addiction or dependency issues, but certainly you can't be a therapist for 25 years without coming across it, and it's very, very prominent in our culture, and I'm sure others. 
She says, hi, Dr. Margaret, and congratulations on your 100th episode. You've been a grounding force in my life, and I look forward to listening to your podcast each week. I'm wondering if you could discuss your views on the 12-step programs. My husband is in AA, and I'm in Al-Anon. I feel that I've received a great deal of help from the program, and I'm wondering if any of your clients are in 12-step groups. My husband's attendance in meetings has actually been slacking, whereas my attendance in Al-Anon has been increasing. I'm getting the feeling that he's starting to resent my increased involvement, as it does take away time from us as a couple. This causes me anxiety and resentment because I feel he should be grateful that I'm happier as a result of the program, and after all, he's the alcoholic that led me to Alan in the first place. We are in couples therapy, which I'm very grateful for, and we have a therapist who's very skilled and impartial. I'm thankful that my husband is willing to go to therapy, and our marriage has improved because of it. I don't push my husband to attend more meetings, but I think it would really help him. He's not gone back to drinking, but he does have a lot of anxiety. He's been on Xanax for decades. He's been on Xanax for decades, and he has a history of panic attacks. I just think it'd be great if we could be on the same page, that it would bring us closer together. So here's my response. Thanks so much for listening and reaching out with a great question. AA is not for everyone, but I have seen it be an incredible support for the people that use it well. You don't say why your husband has stopped attending, but it sounds on one level as if he may believe he's got the whole alcohol thing taken care of, and your continued participation in Al-Anon may serve as a reminder to him of the problem. I'm obviously not sure about this, but some people have trouble with the idea that AA strongly suggests that recovery is an ongoing process and that certainly alcoholism has many more facets than simply being about alcohol consumption. Any addiction is like that. You can stop gambling and still not understand or take responsibility for what's underneath that addiction. Since your husband has anxiety and panic, then those problems are coming from somewhere, and Xanax will not fix them. There's also the term dry drunk, which I've heard often. That's someone who no longer drinks, but whose personality is still one, where blaming and denial are a problem. If al message of detach with love, which is what their major message is, I believe, if that's helping you, then that's good. And I can hear your sadness that for him, he's done what he's going to do, which, of course, is his right. I do see people who are in AA and al and suggest it often to others. Celebrate Recovery is another group that has a different approach than AA, but uses a similar mentoring system. Some people who aren't religious have a problem with AA's inclusion of God as their higher power. And yet I've talked to many of those people who still participate, just find their own way of understanding that particular step. I'm glad the two of you are getting therapy. Perhaps hearing him talk with a therapist about his reluctance or how he views the issue will give you a chance to talk about your own loneliness. I'd recommend that you stay focused on what you're benefiting from there and let him know how helpful it is to you as an individual. Okay, last and certainly not least, again, I hope you're enjoying this. I had a great time picking them out and trying to find ones that I thought maybe about some things that I had not talked about in other letters or other emails. So here we go. I'm a 30-year-old living in England and have been in counseling for about a year. First, I want to thank you for all your efforts to create self-work. I stumbled across it one day. A lot of people tell me they stumbled across the podcast. I don't know quite what I can do about that, but I'm glad they've stumbled. I've since listened to every episode, sometimes more than once. I find them to be insightful, practical, and greatly comforting. Thank you. I've also recommended it to lots of my friends who are going through difficult times, and they've all said the same and are all now big fans of self-work. Well, that's great. That's the best thing any of you could do. So the reason I'm emailing is because despite being in therapy, I can't seem to be completely honest about parts of my life for which I know there's a lot of shame. I have great respect for my therapist and look up to her hugely, and I think in some way I don't want her to change her opinion of me, but still want some advice. I know that a lot of my issues are caused by very low self-esteem, mainly about my physical appearance. I've always thought that I was fat for as long as I can remember and know that my upbringing had a lot to do with this. I've recently made the link that I used sex and food as comforts or ways to make myself better. I would have sex to validate that I was worth being interested in. 
These relationships were always very unhealthy and sometimes, looking back, dangerous. And they got riskier and riskier as I tried to please and be really desirable. When I wasn't distracted by that, I would then binge eat in a robotic fashion, as I still didn't feel good about myself once that temporary buzz of sex had gone. I'm now in a very stable, healthy, and loving relationship and no longer need the risky sex part of my life to make me feel loved. But I can't seem to stop emotionally eating. I secretly eat and feel great shame around my weight, despite not being dramatically overweight. I feel like my size is the only thing that people see about me. So I put myself down saying things like, I know I'm fat, so, or I make fun of myself. I also feel shame associated with trying to change my weight because I feel like people will know I'm unhappy with my appearance and find that embarrassing for them to know, wow, that's really a big loop, isn't it? And if I don't succeed, I fear that people will laugh at me or know that I've somehow failed. I'm sure there are many of you out there who can identify with this writer. Thank you so much for reaching out, as well as your kind words about self-work. I love doing the podcast, mainly because of hearing from people just like you. You can do me no greater honor than by telling people you care about that self-work has been helpful to you. So my gratitude for that as well. Your question is one that so many people have. If I know something is addictive for me, if the circumstances for the behavior beginning in the first place are now different, maybe even better, Why do I continue the self-destructiveness? In your particular story, I hear a couple of things. First, shame still seems to be rampant. You somehow feel like you'll lose your therapist's acceptance if you tell. You describe yourself as not significantly overweight, but that you're unacceptable for the way you are. Shame only leads people, all of us, to remain self-destructive. Logically, it would seem perhaps that shame would prevent self-destructiveness, but it doesn't. If anything, it eggs it on. You're also doing what's called projecting, it sounds like, believing others see you as you see yourself. Your therapist is included in that. What other things define you? What do others tell you about yourself? One of the things I like to do is suggest that people write down 20 things about themselves. This listener might write down, I'm overweight or I feel overweight. But then you put something different on every card and you shuffle them. Then pick one card. The question is, does this completely define me? Then you reshuffle and do it again. Does this completely define me? The answer is obviously no. One characteristic of you does not define you. I would begin by telling your therapist that there's something you haven't admitted or revealed. And then talk about what keeping the secret is like. It feels pretty bad. In fact, awful. So that's where you can begin. You talk about talking. Hopefully that will act to prepare you to reveal what you feel is so shameful. The secret eating. Not wanting others to judge you because you might fail. I promise you you're far from alone if you use sex to feel attractive or valuable. That's a club many of us belong to. And it's a common way for people with esteem struggles to connect. It's to your credit that you stop that pattern and have found someone who loves you well. A practical suggestion is also to begin listening to meditation tapes or apps like Headspace that can help you channel your thoughts and learn to focus. In fact, Headspace, which I do, has a pack on coping with cravings that might be helpful. Also helpful, the book by John Kabat-Zinn, The Mindful Way Through Depression. A mindful technique can insert time into what are your automatic behaviors, and even that little amount of time can help you begin to gain more control. I hope that these listener emails have been helpful for you today. I want to say to you how honored I am that you tune in every week or perhaps only when the episode really fits you or seems to speak to you. Many of you, however, tell me that you listen to ones that really don't because you learn about something maybe that your friend is going through, your son or daughter, your parent, whomever. Don't forget to email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. To any of you who might want a free copy of Marriage is Not for Chickens, I'm giving away five. 
And I'll look forward to hearing from you. All you have to do is just say, I love the book. (laughs) As I say every week, there are many ways of getting in touch with me. We've already talked about emailing me. My website is drmargaretrutherford.com. And I blog there weekly. You can subscribe there. And that'll get you my weekly blog post and this podcast, or you can subscribe wherever you listen to self-work. That subscription number is growing and gives me such excitement and motivation to continue with 101 and 102 and 103. I was told when I first began this journey that the average number of podcasts that people created was eight. I'm now on episode 100, and again, it's because of you, your support, your encouragement, and the fact that you tell me that it's helpful. So I do ask that you leave a rating or review, especially on iTunes, because that's the way so many people listen. And the more ratings and reviews I have, the more people are likely to tune in and stumble upon self-work. So I'll see you next week for episode 101. Thanks for joining my anniversary party or my, would it be my birthday party or my anniversary party? I'm not sure. I guess my anniversary party. Thank you again for joining me. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.